so we started a, a day or two ago, and we're midway through the second, uh, the second I'm going to call each one an essay, the second essay on the spiritual realm. And um, the uh, basic point here is that um, after discussing the ways in which we can think about God as creator and originator of all, and how um, uh, as the absolute creator which brought everything into being uh, and, uh, everything, and has everything contained within it that would apply not only to the physical finite realm of creation but also to the spiritual plane of creation as well. He's elaborating in this little section on the spiritual plane of creation. He's discussing how just like in the physical world there are a myriad of many different creations, so too in the non-physical spiritual world there are a myriad of many different types of creations. Some of them would be like angels or um, uh, demons or souls or other types of forces. But there are you know, different creations within the spiritual realm. And just like in the physical realm, each of the different types of species has a specific set of laws and, uh, that govern it and that affect it. And there are some laws which generally affect all created physical things. So the same thing in the spiritual realm. There are specific laws and, uh, and guidelines and limitations which affect um, any of the particular creations in the spiritual realm. And there are those that apply to all of, uh, all of the, 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 throughout the entire realm of the, of, of, of the spiritual plane of existence as well. And he said that there are basically uh, three different categories. If you remember, the three categories were basically forces, the second one was angels. The third one is demons. We haven't seen the third one yet. But um, this would be the breakdown. Where did he say that the human soul fit in? There are three different types. The one is the kochos, the second is the angels, and the third one is the neshamos. Ah, okay. So kochos would be those forces... Um, of divine energy, whether negative or positive, which flow down into the world for good or for bad. The second would be the malachim, those are the angels. And we spoke about how angels are like pockets of divine energy through which the divine will is executed. And then the third one is the neshamos. We actually covered all three. We did the kochos, we did the malachim, Right, we did the as well. Of course we did, yeah. And we were speaking about how um, there's the category of the souls as well. And the souls are outside of the body. And the bottom um, was just reviewing page 173 uh, before we start 174. 173, we're talking, there, also, there, there is the soul. The soul is something which is outside of the body. It, it exists before the body in the area that we call the goof, which is a repository mm -hmm. for souls before those souls are brought down into the body. Um, the soul can also live outside of the body as well after death. And remember, he described that there are two, those are two planes of existence. The uh, laws that operate upon a soul before it's placed into the body are different than the laws that operate upon after it leaves the body. And we spoke, for example, about how in the former scenario, um, the uh, soul will not have been tainted in any way by any transgression that could, be take, that could result from a person's being in a body. Uh, and secondly, once that soul goes through the body, it's like going through that portal which then sends it in a trajectory of perfection, which is going to open up that soul to experiences of reincarnation, right? Um, or the world to come, heaven, right? Gan Eden, or Gehinnom, um, and ultimately preparing it for Trisimesim and resurrection. So those would be, therefore he did discuss, that, that we did see the author's discussion of Kochos, um, uh, Neshamos, and Malachim. Now, he's adding another category, another type, and that's on the top of page 174. There is yet another type or species of spiritual creations which exist. It is kind of an intermediary between the physical and the spiritual. It has, for example, certain ways in which it is limited by the physical world, by natural laws, things that govern the physical world and its limitations. 
And in some ways, it is independent of these as well. V'shem haminazei nikroim shedim. And the name of this particular species is shedim. Okay? Shedim is the term for demons. And just as I mentioned that uh, it's the generally accepted practice that we don't mention the names of angels, for example, or the names of uh, specific demons, it's also customary not even to use the name for demons, which is shading. Again, in the context of learning, you know, perhaps there, you know, according to custom, people might be lenient about this. But in general, very, very, you know, very many people are particular just uh, even using the term that they, they refer to the shadim as shin dalid, spelling it out rather than saying it, saying it in full. And this, like I said, has to do with what we discussed yesterday, that um, we actually have a power of speech, which is not just our ability to speak, but there is a power inherent in our ability to speak, which connects us to the spiritual realm and enables us to have creations in the spiritual realm do our bidding. And when a person says the names of angels and the names of demons, he's actually causing them to become crystallized in his presence for the purpose of doing his bidding. And if he doesn't know, therefore, how to harness that energy which he's called forth to him, so the energy is called forth for naught. And it can often explode in his face, as it were. And the person himself can come to harm as a result of... So the same thing is, is true and all the more so regarding demons. And therefore people in general in particular, not to mention specific names, and uh, certainly not to mention uh, names of demons either. There's a king demon, for example, which is named Ashmodoi. People are particular not to pronounce that. What is that? Ashmanoi. Or... What? Samel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's already the name of an angel. Satan. Yes, yeah, Samel. That's the Sitra Acha. That's the Don't we say Yetzirah. it now during Kriya Shema al Don't we mention their names? Um, we uh, mention the names of angels right during the, yeah, during the service of Kriya Shema. Not actually in the Shema, of course, but yeah, it's part of the formula that's said there in the bedtime Shema. And we mentioned there that... Um, when it's um, in, in certain so kinds... Why would we be saying that at such a crucial time, right before we're going to sleep? Oh, so, so yes, yeah, so I mentioned... Yeah, that's a very good right. question. Right. I mentioned yesterday that... What's that? Right. No. Right. So, uh, at least the Hasidim do. Yeah. Um, what's a Hasidim? <laughs> what's a Hasid? <laughs> the, yeah, the, the Hasid is like the, you know, the, the Hasidic, the Hasidic Jews. The I, ones I don't with get the, what they mean. I mean yeah. They're more black right. and white. I, I, I don't know if someone will or not. Yeah. I have a few questions being generated here. Let's take them one by one. Yeah. Okay. Um, there, there is a practice, at least among certain groups of, uh, you know, of orthodoxy, when saying the bedtime Shema, to say not only the Shema and verses which accompany it, but also call upon, say, certain prayers and formulas which are intended to um, help the soul in its elevation during sleep. And this would connect to what we were talking about at the end of Tomer Dvorah, remember? We were talking about saying the Shema and the verses that are said there. We didn't go into the details of the fact that part of what's mentioned there are the names of angels. But his question is, how can you be calling upon the names of angels based on the things that we're saying? So the answer would be connected to something which we said yesterday, which is that what we generally refrain from is saying the names unnecessarily, or in the, in the case of, let's just say, conversation. But if it's in the context of learning, or if it's, for example, someone's name, we, you know, the custom is to say the, the, the name of the angel. So the same thing here. In the bedtime Shema, it was actually incorporated as part of the prayer. It says Satan in it. What's that? It says Satan in it. Fine. That's also okay. But I thought you were, mentioned, I thought you were referring to the, to the reference in the Shema, which talks about Gavriel and Uriel and Mikhail. Yeah. Right? Repeat it three times. Three yeah, times. yeah. So um, in, in, you know, in all of those cases, Yigar B'chaz Satan is basically a, a verse which is used to put the Satan in its place. And uh, calling upon the other angels, uh, the Uriel and the Gabriel and the Mikhail, so forth and so on, in order to help encapsulate the soul with protective energy on its ascension into the spiritual realm during sleep, so that it will not be affected by demons and other inhabitants of the lower spiritual realm. And it will have a trajectory which goes up into the higher realm in order to be rejuvenated at, uh, at the height of sleep 
uh, at the height of his ascension, the end of the night before being brought bound and back into the person to renew him and undergo a type of mini-resurrection in order to go into the new day, which will be like the world to come. It's a new world this day. It's night like we had yesterday. This is a world to come where we're going to make a new world based on our new commitment and our refreshing, and our, our, the, the, uh, after having pressed the refresh button through sleep. So this is like a mini resurrection into a mini world to come, where today is a different world than it was yesterday. I'm a different person, I was born anew. Yeah? But all of that is going to be achieved through uh, what happens to the souls kind of being uh, refreshed through sleep. And part of that, um, ensuring that that happens in the best way, is calling upon the power of the angels to do that. So when the sages, in their wisdom, um, 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 composed for us, or, or, or let's say infused verses within the service for that purpose, that's also okay. That's yeah, part of the formalized prayer. Part, part of the formalized prayer. Um, here I'm just going, the general convention is not to pronounce this term shading, but rather to say shindaladim. Yeah? No, what, uh, what, what, what are the, what are the Hasidim? So, uh, you know, as you know, there are different uh, groups within uh, the Jewish people that evolved generally as a result of the exile, so that you have Jews of Eastern lands that are generally considered to be like the Sephardim, right? Although that term Sephard actually means Spain. Mm-hmm. Well, more typically speaking, mm-hmm. it, it's, it's you know, the Sephardim and the, the what they call the Eidos of Midra, Mizrach, which is you know, Jewish, mm-hmm. Jews from the Eastern countries. And you have the Ashkenazim, right? And generally in the, in the European countries, among the Ashken- in each general group, you have subgroups, right? Among the uh, the Spain, you have from Castile, and you have from um, what do they call it? Uh, well, it's not so relevant nowadays because it's not that, that that prevalent. But you have others from, you know, Morocco, and some from Iraq, and there there, there are differences. The same thing in the Ashkenazim. <laughs> so you have. Uh, so, Certain uh, Ashkenazi groups, which are more mainstream traditional Ashkenaz, and others who um, kind of followed the teaching of the Baal Shem Tov, which was introducing into the Ashkenazi community some of the, the Kabbalistic teachings. The truth is that Kabbalah, Kabbalah exists among the Ashkenazim in the Middle Ages as well. There was what we called Hasid Ashkenaz, would be is referring to a school of Kabbalists that really were. Um, um, Operating in, uh, in in Germany. So how do you pick what you want to be? Oh, that's already different. That's already a different discussion. Yeah, we're already going beyond what we need yeah, to in the scope. But we'll, we'll talk about it if you want. Like, do, do you just choose or? <laughs> yeah, you you can. One can do that. Oh. One can do that. But let's 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 talk about it. Let's let's okay. let's, let's fix an appointed time to talk about. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, here, it's just, you know, he, here in the text, therefore, what he's making reference to is the Shindaladim, these demons, and there are different uh, explanations as to why they are called the, this, by this term, the Shindalad or the Shade. Uh, one reason, of course, is because the demons are like shady characters. <laughs> so that, that's one explanation as to why they're called Shade. But more seriously. Um, also, a sickness, you know, like uh, they don't want to mention them, they say the big C. Yeah, 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 Yenamachla. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 They don't want to mention them. That's, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's generally related to what we're talking about, but slightly different because there it's kind of like not being in the. You shouldn't open his mouth to the Satan. The person shouldn't mention things which are harmful because he might be kind of bringing that harm upon him. It's related in general, but this is more specific, actually, saying the name. Mm-hmm. So in any case, um, these, uh, one explanation is that it comes from the word sade. Sade, where sade means field. And since these uh, demons are like uh, extra societal beings, you know, they're on the outside, the, the perimeters of, the, of, the inha- of, of inhabitation. And in fact, the sources say that they actually found and that's where they, that's where they, they occupy mm-hmm. deserted areas, uh, forlorn, re- removed areas, away from people, and so forth and so on. Um, and it's for this reason that we find that we're discouraged from walking alone in deserted areas, uh, particularly at night, because uh, these demons have uh, more of a presence there in those places or at those times. Um, 
another explanation that's given is that um, it's related to the word showed. Where showed means uh, robbery. And these shadim are interested in robbing people of what makes them uh, uniquely human and depriving them, therefore, of uh, exercising the free will properly or depriving them of the mitzvot that they could do or the Torah that they can learn in order to zap out uh, the, uh, the, the positive energy that, that results from Torah learning and, and, and mitzvah observance. And as we go along, we'll see why they might do that. But for now, I'm just introducing different reasons as to why they are called this term shading, either because related to sade or shod, robbery, uh, we find that the Torah also refers to them as seirim. Seirim means goats. Don't sacrifice to the seirim. These are the demons, the Torah tells us. Don't sacrifice to the demonic forces, magic and uh, black magic and witchcraft and wizardry and things like this. So they refer to it as seirim, where seir is also a goat. And uh, the explanation here is that, yes, the, the angel, the, 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 these demons... Uh, like, like goats hop and dance and move around and very active and kind of mischievous. So they're, they're referred to as the Seirim. But in any case, this is, the, uh, this is a, a parallel category, which is not only not included in the first three, because the first three are purely spiritual beings. You have forces, yes, as spiritual creations. You have souls as purely spiritual creations, and you have angels, which are purely spiritual cre- creations. The demons, he says already from the outside, are like midway between. Not entirely spiritual and not entirely physical. Midway between. The Gemara actually says that um, they are a class of its own, which um, are midway between angels and human beings. Midway between a- angels and human beings. The Gemara says the demons are like angels in three ways. And like humans in three ways. They're like angels in three ways. The, the demons have wings like angels. They fly like angels. And they know the future like angels. Those are the three ways. Now, angels don't have wings, as we discussed yesterday. Um, <laughs> but whatever having wings means, that's what demons have. Uh, and it must be something than just referring to the ability to fly because we're told that flying is a separate thing. So they have wings and they can fly. I once thought that you know, maybe the idea of wings is that wings manipulates the ability to fly. It's like wings are the, the rudders of flight. So it's something that have the ability to fly, but the wings enable that motion to enable, the, enable the, the, per, the person to be able to, to manipulate the motion. And I just well, thought to myself, perhaps, and somebody mentioned this, I think, uh, about angels having uh, free will. That angels can fly, but they also have wings, which means they can fly, they do God's bidding. But they also, at least in theory, have wings. Yeah? Which means they can exercise at least theoretically, some free will decision about navigating the, 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 the uh, message that they're sending, for example. Uh, the Mikhtab Miliao, I think, discusses this, that angels also have free will. It's just that they see things so clearly that for all intents and purposes, they don't act upon their free will in any way which would deny God. But at least they have wings. If I'm understanding this correctly, then, that flight is the ability to do something, wings is the ability to manipulate that act, so demons also have that to an even greater degree. They can fly, but they have wings, which would be uh, an ability to assert some form of free will on, their, on, on whatever message or purpose that they're being sent to do. The third thing is um, they can tell the future like the angels, and uh, the Gemara discusses that uh, they can see the future, but they can't see very far. So angels can fly faster and do more and also see more about the future. But the demons that inhabit the lower realm, they are given um, some inkling of the future, but not to the same extent as, uh, as angels have. There are three ways in which the demons are considered to be like humans. 
They eat like humans. They drink like humans. And I believe the third one is that they reproduce like humans. Okay? So the commentators explain in the Kabbalah that eating and drinking like humans does not mean that they actually consume food and drink. But rather, just as human beings consume food and drink for their sustenance, so the demons consume the vapors of the food and drink that are offered to them as sacrifices by their worshipers. So that people who worship the demons offer sacrifices and the food of the animals is burned and combusted and the liquids, the wine or the vapors that are resulting from these burned sacrifices are actually taken up somehow by the demon and it's used to sustain them. It gives them energy. And um, the, uh, the, the Zohar talks about how uh, it, this is actually how demonology works. People offer sacrifices to the demons. The demons derive some benefit from the activity that the humans are doing in honor of the demons. And the demons therefore bestow them, the people who gave them this energy, this food, this drink, this sacrifice, with power. Some of the power of the demon. And in this way, people tap into demonic, demonic forces. And they can use these dark demonic forces for magic and witchcraft. And they are also given sometimes an inkling into the future. But their vision, of course, would only be limited to the limit of the, of the demon into the future. A person who's tapping into these things from the holy side right, can attain much greater degrees. First of all, of energy, because very little light dispenses a lot of darkness. And also of foresight, and knowledge, and insight, so that the prophecy that comes about through angels is going to be much greater than the, than the insights into the future that demonologists get out of connecting to demons. That would be the first two of food and drink. Is this a bit too far out? No. Okay. So it's okay today? Yeah. <laughs> well, now we know where your head's at. Yeah. Now, the, th the third thing is <laughs> demon reproduction. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's food for thought at your next barbecue, right? <laughs> in any case, the third way in which demons are compared to humans is that they reproduce like, pre reproduce like human beings. They don't have bodies, and they don't have sexual organs, and they don't have sexual fluids. So they can't be reproducing like human beings. But the way in which, just like we explained the, re the relationship of food to human beings as being similar to that of, uh, of sacrifice to the demons, so human sexuality is, is used to fuel demon sexuality as well. And uh, the mystical sources in Judaism talk about, therefore, that um, if a person is involved in, uh, in, in forbidden sexual acts, he's actually generating that energy and wasting it in a way which will be utilized by the demons. In fact, demonology, magic and witchcraft, and even idolatry in general, is often inextricably bound with sexuality, sexual immorality. And we find in Torah sources all the time the connection between idolatry and adultery. So that they kind of go hand in hand. But in any case, um, this would be an example, a more specific example of what I was talking about earlier when I said the demons are like robbers which are trying to wring out of people what's uniquely human about them and their ability to do good. And one of the realms of that place is wringing out of people their sexual energy. And uh, an example of the way this happens, which is discussed, is that a female demon, for example, can appear to a man, entice him to have an emission. That sexual energy that's released is then taken by her, and, and, and the result is to produce little demon babies. <laughs> They're not physical babies, yeah, but what's happening is, is the sexual energy is used to reproduce more of that demonic energy. And I don't want to make anybody too, what's the word I'm like, spooked out, or, or what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like, uh, I don't know the word I'm looking for, I can't think about it right now. But in any case, this is one of the... I, yeah, but you know, when a person's like, you know, all worked up. Freaked out? Yeah, freaked out, but there's a specific word. In any case... Um, <laughs> You know, the, this is one of the ideas behind, um, you, you know, describing the, uh, the, the great import of uh, spilling one's seed in vain. And that um, that type of energy that is wasted that way is lapped up 
by the, the demons, and it's used for dream and reproduction. And it can happen the other way as well, that um, a male demon can entice a female and uh, work her up and use that feminine, feminine energy, sexual reproductive energy that's, that she stirs up in order to um, reproduce himself as well. And some sources actually say it works both ways, that the female entices a man and the male entices a female, and that enables both the male and female demon now to interact and reproduce. Okay, where each one is drawing the, 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 the sexual energy from either the male or the female, and then that male-female energy is, is fused in order to make the demon, the demon energy. But it's kind of, you know, far out. It's far, far out in a way. But in any case, um, these are the, uh, I'm just saying this, uh, discussing this, because we spoke about how demons are like midway between humans and angels. So you see that they, they eat, but not really. They reproduce, but not really. Yeah? Or they fly, but not really. Or they see the future, but not really. They're somewhat like angels, and they're somewhat like humans. The Midrash says that um, um, uh, uh, on that final sixth day of creation, after having created man, and after having separated the female component of man from the male masculine component of man, so that mankind was separated into male and female, physical components and spiritual components, God then went on to create the demons. But, uh, but, uh, but Shabbos came in before God was able to finish the creation of the demons. And therefore he couldn't complete, he couldn't complete the creation. And this, this, this Midrash is, uh, is understood in the con- as being related to what we were just saying before, that they're not entirely spirit- physical and not entirely spiritual. They're not entirely physical because God didn't finish completing them before creation. They're not entirely spiritual because God had started before Shabbos came in. So they were left in this limbo state of being literally the twilight of creation between the sixth day and Shabbos, that twilight zone of neither purely physical nor entirely spiritual. And it's interesting when you think about creation uh, as a hierarchy where God first created the inanimate objects, and then the living things. Living things first were created in the form of plants and vegetation, and then animals. Among the animals, there was a separation between animals and humans. Within the humans, there was a separation between man and woman. And the closer you go, or the, right, the further you go along that hierarchy, the higher level of spirituality you're talking about. So that right, plants are more spiritual than inanimates, Animals are more spiritual than plants. Humans are more spiritual than animals. Women are more spiritual than men. men. <laughs> Demons are more spiritual than human beings. So it's actually quite an interesting thing. I mean, according to the Midrash, God had something very important planned for these demons. It's almost as if, if you're talking about creation taking place in a hierarchy, they would have been the crowning glory of creation, even above w- woman. But God didn't manage to finish before Shabbos came in, so he had to drop it. The Midrash compares this to somebody who's walking along the way, and he's got a precious jewel in his pocket. Right? Shabbos comes in, he has no choice but to throw the, throw the gem aside. So too God was in the act of creating these demons. Shabbos came in and he had to let it go. So you see from the language of the Midrash itself, it compares the demons to gems. Almost implying, like I said, that the demons were intended, as it were, to be the crown and glory of creation. How God didn't manage to finish before Shabbos comes in, I'm not quite sure what, what the teaching means to say by that. But in any case, what happened was that whatever grandiose plans were in mind for these demons... The plans were discarded, like the person who discards that jewel. The jewel is a jewel, but it gets lost in the dust. So these demons were like relegated to being in this twilight state. They don't have the advantage of being in bodies in this world in order to operate using free will in order to glorify God. But they can't be full members of the spiritual realm either because they're connected and anchored in this world in some way. So it's because of this reason that the demons are constantly looking to, like I said before, 
uh, tap into the energy that's created through our free will, either for good or for bad, and in many ways deprive us of it. Why? Because they're being, they're, of their being jealous of the fact, jealous, quote-unquote, that we have the free will in the body to, right, to, to affect our perfection, which they don't have. And therefore, there is this kind of, I don't know, love-hate relationship between demons and humans. On the one hand, they want very much to be like us. On the other hand, they envy us. On the one hand, they show us what it means for a physically rooted being to be spiritual, right? Like an angel, but they themselves are not angels. So there's this very kind of interesting relationship. Well, maybe as we talk more, we'll see. There are good demons and there are bad demons. There are examples of both. But somebody had his hand up. I think it was you. Yeah, uh, I just wanted to ask, like, what does that mean that Hashem can finish creation? Does it make sense in a way? Yeah, I asked the same question. You know, I, I, you know, I, 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 yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't have like a great answer to that question. You know, so what, what was, what was God's intention? Was His intention to finish? Was His intention perhaps not to finish? You know, maybe his intention was not to finish. And demons, therefore, have a role in that spectrum between the physical and the spiritual. Inanimate, plant, animal, man, woman, demon, angel, right? And then oilamos, atzilus, briet, sira, and asiya. There's a whole spectrum there. And therefore, you know, maybe it was, it, it was God, you know, you know it, it's spoken about in, in the language of God did not manage to finish creating them until by the time Shabbos came in, so you had to discard it. But maybe, you know, but is there something, is there anything God can't do? <laughs> the point is that, that there is a being which was created during the twilight period that's been a shmashos between the weekday and Shabbos, and that's exactly what it is. It's, it, it has a role in the spectrum of spiritual, of physicality going to spirituality. In a way, Hashem doesn't have time. It doesn't work by a clock. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Yeah, so, so, yeah, God kind of binds him. Shem doesn't have, like, oh, uh, in five minutes, uh, doesn't have, it takes me to do this. There's no time. It's not even, it doesn't even take him point, point, point zero, 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 one of a second to do something. You know what I mean? He doesn't have to, like, when he's running the world, he's not like, Oh, uh, yeah, uh, wait, my friend Chaim needs to also walk. It's not like a Lego yeah. set, you yeah. know what I mean? Like, oh, wait, 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 three seconds. I'm middle of walking him to the corner store. That's an interesting point, because, yeah, it would seem that God can instantaneously do everything. He can multitask. He is the multitasker of the universe. Split the sea, like, how do you explain, like, if he split the sea, like, wait. But nevertheless, you do see in creation a, a progression. Nevertheless, the Torah does describe creation as a progression. There was first this, and then that, and then that, and then that, and then that. But Hashem, Hashem fro, uh, made the sun wait for twice, right? Twice so God overrode the natural laws, yeah. but there is a, 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 a normal natural progression of time. So you, you know, could, God could have. So God is not limited. But it's, it's true, God could override that. And God chose not to. God said Shabbos comes in. You know, God's not bound by Shabbos. It's true. The Gemara talks about how, you know, how is it God can bring rain on Shabbos if we can't irrigate agriculture. God's not bound by the laws of Shabbos. But in any case, um, you know, these are interesting questions. And um, just one second. Um, um, your point is very well taken. And um, the fact that creation is nevertheless described, at least in the Torah, as occurring through a progression or series of events, um, perhaps given your point, we can understand something we made, a point we made the other day about Pro, um, creation being a result of progressive recession, right, of tzimtzum, so that it has to be sequential. Of course, if you look about it, God's proactively creating, God could do everything, boom, at once. But if you talk about creation in, in, in the terms of tzimtzum, whereby everything is God, creation is just a reducing of the intensity of God's presence at any particular area which becomes space, or, I don't know, Confluence, which we end up calling time, so that has that has to be gradual, as it were. God is gradually reducing the intensity of His presence, so that more and more of things other than God can seem to take take form and come into existence. So, so, so maybe that's why creation is described as progression, because it's not proactively creating; it's a result of a sequential regression. But what were you going to say? When were the angels created then? 
the uh, demons were created right before coming Shabbos? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That, that's an interesting point, because, uh, I mean, our sources seem to say that demons are actually created from day one. Mm -hmm. Right? And uh, when God says, Nase Adam, let us make man, why was he speaking in the plural? One answer is he was speaking, speaking in the rural we. As the king would say, we hereby proclaim. Uh, another answer that's given is, I think Rashi brings it, that he was... Mm -hmm. Taking it, he was taking advice as it were. He was consulting with the angels. Where were the angels? The angels had already been created from what, day one. You're saying it's a progression. Right, right. Well, that doesn't fit into so how would that fit in? Yeah. So how would that fit in? Um, well, you know, perhaps the way that could fit in is that um, um, Shabbos is like a um, refraction, which is then re-refracted into oneness. So that there was the state of God's existence before creation took place. There is a, what's what I'm looking for, like a um, multiplicity through the progression of one, two, three, four, five. But Shabbos brings everything back to the source again. So it could very well be that, you know, that you know, the, 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 the marching on towards multiplicity, which is creation, culminated in the demons. And then, right, Relooped into, relooped into what was existence before the first day of creation, and that would be angels. The angels were part of the spiritual realm that were created before the physical form of uh, of the world. Reishis Barlokim Esa Shamayim doesn't mean the atmosphere; it means the spiritual realm. Ves Arts, which means the metaphysical plane and the universe. Shamayim the Arts. Arts is not just planet Earth. All of physical creation was in this state of discombobulation. Why? Because there was this huge explosion that just took place. And mass is floating everywhere, yeah? And then God caused the land to appear. Physicality emerged from this chaos in the form of planets and stars and everything else, including planet Earth. And on Earth, what happened, happened. But in any case, if you think about... Um, Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six. What is day seven? Shabbos, right? Now go back. That first Shabbos was preceded by day six, day five, day four, day three, day two, day one. What was before day one? Creation. No. Nothing. Nothing. Shabbos. Oh, no. <laughs> right? What day, what day comes before, before Monday or Sunday? Sunday. Sa Saturday. Shabbos, right? So, so that, that in a way, right, day seven is really looping back around to, to the state of existence that, 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 that was before, before creation. Shabbos is still a part of creation, though. Like, so creation didn't stop on day six. Creation continued into Shabbos. It's a day of rest, yes, but it's still like, it's an essential part of creation. He's creating the Shabbos on the seventh day. The, 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 in the resting, <laughs> that's how he created the Shabbos. Yeah. The, the, the model that I was using before about not viewing, as we normally do, creation as a, a result of a, of a proactive act, right? But rather the result of a, of a regression. So what that means is, on day one, God retracted this amount. Day two, this amount. Three, four, five, six, to an even greater amount. And the greater, the greater extent to which God retracted from His oneness, there, came into, there emerged a, a, a greater degree of of multiplicity, yeah? When God, therefore, rested on Shabbos, He didn't, like, desist from action. What it really means is, He desisted from retracting, which is another way of saying, He let His hair down, yeah? He let His hair down, as it were. Let His pass out, yeah? And He reintroduced Himself now into a world where, when it, in, it, where now that God's presence became infused in that world, it would not implode back into oneness. Because the structure had been made. It's kind of like, you know, if you want to make a dam. So you have to hold that water back, construct the dam, but at some point, once the, the, the dam has been properly constructed, you let that flow of water go through in a, in, in, a, in a specific way, and now it can be harnessed for energy and hydraulic power and everything else. So that's kind of like what happened. That's, that, that's the way I understand Kabbalah is explaining it. It's not that God proactively created X, Y, and Z, but He retracted to degrees. 
so forth and so forth and so forth. On Shabbos, he rested. It doesn't mean he rested from proaction, from exertion, but he resisted from holding himself back. In other words, he let himself back into the world. And in this way, that seventh day was reconnected to the state of existence that was before day one, which is Shabbos. And I think, you know, you can also, if we had time, elaborate on, on how this might be collected, the connected teaching, which says if the Jewish people just kept two Shabbos, they would immediately be, what Shabbos we're talking about, we're saying, using Shabbos to get connected to the Shabbos that was before creation. That would bring about the redemption. We would get back to square one. Which is, the, which is where the time went, you know, basically preparing for the, the period when Adam and Eve were created and so forth and so on. We've kind of run a bit out of time to elaborate on that. Maybe we'll do it another time. Um, in any case, the, uh, we should try and find some place to tie off for now this discussion about the demons. So let's see if we can finish this paragraph here. Um, so we're talking about how elaborating on this sentence, how uh, we're describing demons as being midway through, midway between. They have some material aspects. But not like our bodies. And they have some components of spirituality. But not like the spiritual beings entirely. So this, this would parallel the teaching in the, Torah, the, the, the Talmud that I was mentioning before, that there are three ways in which they are like humans, but not entirely, and three ways in which they're like the angels, but not entirely. And here too, in demons, just like is the case regarding souls, and powers, forces, and angels, there are many different levels, and many different types. And according to their different levels, so is there also varied the laws that will apply to them. So this would open up the whole discussion about um, there being good demons and bad demons. Some demons are described as even being Tamid Chachamim, Torah scholars. And others are, cons- are, are described as being people and others are described as being animals. So the different levels and classes of demons and different types of things that, uh, that they do. One uh, or two interesting examples of this would be that um, the uh, Gomorrah talks about a certain uh, Rav Yosef shade. Yes? The demon referred to as, I think it says Rav Yosef, maybe it's just Yosef shade, but I think it says Rav Yosef shade. It's a different one, yeah, yeah. But this Rav Yosef Shade, he would, uh, the Gemara say, says, would give a Torah lecture um, one day in Pumpadisa and the other day in, um, I forget the name of the, the other main town. It was um, um, there in, in Pumpadisa. But, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, and if, if I remember correctly, it, what was it called then? No, in Pumpadisa. Two, two um, famous towns in, in Babel, which centers of, of yeshivas and, and Torah learning. Um, in any case, um, I believe the Gemara says that, um, that this demon would give these Torah classes on the same Shabbos in each town, even though they were very far apart. Uh, and humans would not be able to make that, cover that ground, certainly not on Shabbos, when there's a Tchum Shabbos. But Yosef Shed was able to transport itself between these two towns in order to give these Torah lectures. So here would be an example. This would be an example. The Gemara is discussing a demon giving a Torah lecture. He's a Talmud Chacham. I don't know exactly what it means, but that's what the Gemara says. The Gemara says elsewhere that um, the, um, the, regarding the connection between demons and Torah scholars, that um, the, uh, the, um, the claustrophobic feeling that people get at Torah lectures is because the demons are crowded in there together with people as well. And the fact that Torah scholars' clothing rubs out more quickly than other people's is because of the demons constantly rubbing against them. Mm-hmm. And this is understood to mean that... Um, <laughs> it all makes sense now. Yeah, yeah. That the, uh, the, the negative demons... Yeah. 
you know, this is based on the idea that the negative demons are um, attracted to places of Torah learning in order to zap out that energy, like spiritual leeches, and use the energy of the Torah for their own uh, for their own for their own means. Yeah, that's a that's a negative thing, and we see that they're swirling around the Torah scholars, even though they're spiritual, they're somewhat physical, resulting in a friction that over time kind of wears out clothing, which angels would not do. How do we kind of keep the demons away from our Torah and our prayer? By keeping uh, bad thoughts out of our heads and our hearts when we do so, by trying to learn Torah in the most pure intention that we can possibly have, because if a person is learning Torah and praying, um, but he's got all types of demons in his closet, yeah, so he's calling, uh, he's, he, he's, he's basically tainting his Torah and his prayer, and he's making his, his Torah and his prayer like a wound, which spiritual flies are drawn to in order to draw out whatever they can from it. Yeah? It's like opening up the wound and, and presenting the lifeblood, which makes it susceptible to, to, to the outside forces. That's exactly what he's doing. If he's learning Torah or praying in a way which is harmful, he's like creating a spiritual wound which these negative forces come and try and drink the lifeblood out of. Literally like spiritual flies. So the, 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 the more pure attention that we have, the more complete and whole is our Torah and our mitzvah, so the less susceptible we'll be to these types of things. Um, I guess we're over time, and we've got to get to the next class. I forgot about that. So um, there are some other interesting demon stories I would have shared, but I think either we won't or, do, or we'll continue tomorrow. Mm-hmm.